Like water from the wellspring, our spirits will rise to join the streams of thousands who march neath other skies. No river shall contain us, our numbers swell and soar, and we will stand united on freedom shore. Yes, we will stand united on freedom shore. I was, I was involved in implementing the decree against United Airlines, in which hundreds of, of employees were involved. And I tell you, it's very, very hard to try to uh, get the relief for those people. One of the provisions, provisions was, for example, that uh, certain women that were mechanics, but they had them only sewing up uh, Parachutes? No, no, the, the the seats, you know, making the seats for the airplanes. And those were, many of those women were welders, I mean, with qualifications, fantastic qualifications. And uh, one of the remedies was they were kept in that tiny little uh, area, and they didn't get the same pay as the mechanics, even though they were mechanics, but they didn't get the same pay. So under the decree, the ones that wanted to transfer, because many of them were older women, you know, will have the right. The purpose of this videotape is to share some of the information that was presented in employment workshops at the National Women's Conference in Houston, Texas, November 1977. Because the media industry so limited its coverage of this historic conference, only those people who were fortunate enough to go to Houston knew about the many skills workshops and lectures where thousands of women exchanged information with others from all over the world. You will see excerpts from four workshops including Legal Remedies for Employment Discrimination with Maida Cole and Zaxness and Susan Ross, Comparable Worth presented by Helen Remick and Lynn Bruner, Organizing Working Women with Lisa Portman, and Employment Opportunities for Women in Skilled Trades presented by Ann Amy. Additional videotape was shot in Seattle to help explain the relationship between different agencies who process discrimination complaints. Investigation of these complaints and the enforcement of affirmative action is derived from both federal and local laws. The Federal Enforcement Agency is the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, EEOC, and is chaired by Eleanor Holmes Norton. The State Deferral Agency is the Washington State Human Rights Commission. City agencies are the Office of Women's Rights, and the Department of Human Rights, represented on this tape by Roberta Standifer, Ann Davenport, and Patria Robinson Martin. All of them work together to serve women and others who believe they are victims of partial or prejudicial treatment in the workplace. The city, in fact, is a uh, deferral agency for EEOC, and unless something has happened recently, we're the only city a agencies who are uh, deferral agencies are ordinarily state agencies. So we have um, comparable laws and uh, good enforcement procedures that make us recognized by that federal body. Mm -hmm. you, this is very important. 25% of our charges are deferred to state agencies and they get backlogs right. we get them. We are going to be doing work sharing with them. First, we won't be deferring every case of them. If they are backlogged, we will have an agreement whereby they do every second case or every third case, and we do the rest. They must, however, either use our charge processing systems, the, the new ones we've invented, or demonstrate that theirs work as, as rapidly. We will give them the training to do it. We will give them the technical assistance to put it in. It's not going to cost them any money. But we're not going to continue to give money to state and local agencies to build up backlogs, which then yeah. become EOC's mm -hmm. backlog. We think, though, that EOC in the past has not given help to state and local yeah, agencies. They do have some very uh, strict procedures on how they are operating. And of course, now we have a, a new chairperson. And this means that uh, there are going to be some changes that will affect the local agencies that are dealing with them. But I think they're, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like they're for the better, because it will move complaints faster, which means relief for the charging party quicker. Our agency has, uh, in this last year, um, started a process that I'm hearing that Mrs. Norton is speaking of, 
and this uh, process has moved the backlog already. Even before the whole reform, the entire reforms are nationalized by 78, by December 1st, darn it, I forgot to say this, by December 1st, every district office of EEOC will have the backlog charge processing system and the new intake procedures. So that even uh, Houston is not a model, model area, for example, but it will have the backlog charge processing system, which means that they will get to those cases in Chicago, for example, they are closing 50, they are doing, not closing, because they close them in different ways. They're disposing of 50% more cases than they, on a monthly basis, than they did the average monthly basis last year. See, we should talk a little bit more of what kind of remedies you can get in a Title VII case that you file. We've talked about back pay. Um, there's also, we've just talked about front pay. Um, you can also get various kinds of injunctions. You can get an injunction to get your job back. You can get injunctions that cover class relief. Among the employers that uh, we are, have covered in this ordinance are unions and um, employment agencies, those agencies that uh, find employment for you. And this is very important for people to know because a lot of times uh, they think, especially with the union, that their only remedy is to go through an arbitration. And very often arbitrators are not familiar with discrimination. And uh, so if it is a discrimination because of sex or race or something, they should come to one of our agencies. To people don't understand what affirmative action is. They think affirmative action is about setting aside some special places for women and minorities. They don't understand the recruitment systems that are discriminatory, the tests. The, they don't understand any of that. They think it's all about Baki. It's a most unfortunate case to, to have educated the public about affirmative action. Also, the same as Roberta, I started out as an investigator and now I'm in affirmative action. Um, it was. All the time that I was investigator, it was a, it was real clear to me that even in the instance of cases where I was not finding reasonable cause, there was still an educational process going on, um, so that just the process of having that complaint filed and making sure that the employer got a copy of the ordinance, and I was asking a bunch of questions about some things that they'd never even thought about before. Um, became an educational process. I had a case in Texas that this company was very wise. It had women uh, in World War I doing all these jobs that males did. When the males came back from the war, then the women were out. So the few women that remained at the company were supposed to be, to remain single. If they got married, they had to, you know, get out of the company. Then, can you imagine a block? which is divided in the middle. There are jobs over here for women, there are jobs over here for men. The, then there is a tiny little block over here in which there are some men and women. The highest paid job on this side, which was the women's jobs, both of them are clerical, men and women. The highest paid job on the women's side made less than the lowest paid job on the men's side. Not only that, this little group over here in which there were men and women, they did what is called red circle. They took that little block and they said, those are the only people that can transfer here. Nobody else. That has changed, of course, after the lawsuit. And one of the landmark features of legislation for women at work is the Equal Pay Act, and it guarantees equal wages if you are doing essentially the same work. Uh, jobs that are evaluated on the basis of effort, skill, and responsibility. Those are the three key words. It's very nice, but as it turns out in the job situation, most women and also most men are in sex segregated jobs. We can represent this present situation with a line representing kind of the average salary, and we see that the more responsibility you have, the more money you make. What we find when this is applied to a workforce, as was done here in the state of Washington, by looking at the uh, state personnel system and the higher education personnel system, the two classified personnel systems, a sampling was done to see whether comparable work would show that there were differences by sex. We find if we look at only the men's jobs, that is jobs with 30% or fewer women in them, so men pretty much hold these jobs, that the men's jobs with 
just a few exceptions all fall above that average line and those that are below the average line are barely below it. Then if we look at only women's jobs, those jobs which have 30% or fewer men in them, we find that with very few exceptions, the dots all fall below the average line. And in fact, there is no situation within the system where a man's job and a woman's job with approximately the same worth make the same amount of money. There is, that is to say, there is no, uh, there's no overlap between payment to women and payment to men. We can, in fact, represent this as saying that there are two mathematical lines, one for men and one for women. Are women's wages depressed because they do less uh, work of less worth, or are they depressed because of some other factor, such as pervasive discrimination? Comparable worth system can come in. Uh, what you do when you do a comparable worth evaluation or any job evaluation, get a job description. You don't evaluate the person's performance in the job. You're supposed to evaluate what the job itself looks like. And you break the job into the elements of effort, skill, and responsibility, and sometimes additionally working conditions. That is, is it noisy or hazardous to your health and so on? You assign points to each of those factors. Then you get a composite number of points for that job. So some jobs, of course, will take more prior training but not be that responsible on the job. Others will take lots of prior training and have lots of responsibilities. So the factors can come out in very different ways. You give all the jobs final points. When this is applied to a workforce that includes both women's work and men's work, we get some very interesting results. The secretary three with 210 points and 816 a month compares to a construction coordinator with 219 points, all men in it, and making $1,550 a month. Now, that's a sizable difference. There's a $700 a month difference between the construction coordinator and the secretary three for the same value. Well, typing is simply a skill that is undervalued, but did you ever stop to consider that if someone can type 50 words a minute, that using the formula that is used to figure that out, you're usually given a five minute time rate. Right? That is, you must do 1,250 individual finger motions in a five minute time period, usually with an error rate of no greater than five errors during that time. We actually have to type faster than uh, than the, the 1,250 in order to accommodate five errors and still pass your time writing. That's requiring a degree of accuracy that you don't find in many places. And anyone who's been in a clerical job has passed minimally 50 words a minute with less than five errors. It's pretty fantastic and it's just simply not a, a valued skill. So the, we can imagine that in these job evaluation skills that perhaps typing and other women's work, we're not given their full due. For those of you who are not familiar with, with unions in particular, the AFL-CIO is not a union, it is a federation of 110 unions. And uh, they themselves, the AFL-CIO, does not organize. They have an organization department that helps unions and so forth. But they might refer you, say, to the meat cutters or CWA or so forth. And as our sister back here makes a point, they're the Teamsters, and they will organize stewardesses, truck drivers, uh, cookie factories, uh, you know. Uh, and the UAW will do the same. Uh, the mine workers know. Uh, you can get directly in touch with a union if you say, well, clearly we fall into office and professional employees. Uh, call them. In 19... 56 women, all women, organized or not, were making 63 cents for every dollar that a man made. In 1970, making only 59% of what men made. In 1974, 57. So you see, we're falling back, we're falling back. But this includes all categories of workers. And as you know, women are down at the low end of the pay scale, so that's what sort of skews this distribution as much as it does. But a new study has come out from Princeton, a man by the name of Ashford, that breaks things down like um, uh, by like jobs, you know, bakers and bakers, clerks and clerks, tellers and tellers, and so forth. And uh, 
shows that union, this is for women only, I didn't put the men's down, union over non-union, that in 1967, organized black women were making 6% more in the same job than their organized, unorganized sisters. White women were making 14% more than their unorganized sisters. Well, in this period, of course, there was a lot of civil rights activity, so we find a little more justice for the black sisters there. By 1973, black women were making 13% more in the same job, and white women were making 13% more in the same job. In 1975, which are the latest figures available, this has risen to 17% for both black and white. So that means that an extra nickel per dollar, practically, for every woman in her current job, this is comparing oranges and oranges. So it's well worth it. It's well worth organizing working women. And that's only financial. One thing we never got into is that, you know, what unions mainly do is talk about wages, hours, and working conditions. And this is only wages. There's so many other things you can do, working conditions, uh, seniority systems, uh, social issues. There was a case in Pennsylvania, I think it was the dance kit company, although I wouldn't want to be quoted. And they make these little tights and, and things like that for women. And it's almost all women who work there, and they're non-union. And they had a, um, a rape in the parking lot uh, because, you know, it gets dark early now and so forth. And uh, the women got very incensed about that, and management did too. I mean, they didn't want people raped in their parking lots. And, <laughs> and uh, even the community got upset, and they sort of got together, and they got uh, lights in the parking lot and so forth. And the women who had started it were so pleased with themselves and had gotten such a good sense of, of membership that they went on to become a union. So that, that they had such a strong <coughs> issue, and it was one that could not really be opposed by anybody. People don't really realize how much power there is in organizing. Uh, one individual woman has potential power, and that's it. A series of individual women have potential power. It's not until they come together as a group, identify what a collective problem is, come up with solutions, and go about implementing those things, will we ever make the changes that are necessary in a society, and not only in the city, but in the state. First thing you need to do is research the company and find out exactly what they do, what occupations they employ, what their hiring projections are and so forth. For example, you wouldn't want to go to a company that just had a massive layoff and is in a really depressed industry. You'd be wasting your time. Okay. Then if there's any way possible, get somebody to introduce you to top management. It's pretty tough to go in cold to the president of the company or vice president and say, I'm so-and-so and I want this and that if he or she has no idea who you are. So if you have any connections at all, use them for all they're worth. And try, it, if at all possible, try to start with top-level management because if you deal with the personnel people or the affirmative action people, those people rarely have any power whatsoever and you're just wasting your time. They can't make any real decisions. But if the company president says we're going to do this and so and he tells them, then they'll do it. So try to extract a commitment from top management. And it's also good if, you can, if you've done a lot of research on that company or that government agency and you know that a lot of women have been applying for certain kinds of jobs and they haven't been getting hired but other people have. If you can document that sort of information over a period of time, it's, it's really very useful. For example, we did that with the Port of Seattle. We were referring women to all their entry level positions and nobody was getting hired, especially minority women. And we had experience with that over about a year's period of time, and we kept real careful check of that. In our record-keeping system, we have a system whereby we can track who's been referred to what kinds of jobs, so we know that 52 women have gone to the Port of Seattle and one's been, one's been hired. So if you have that documentation all lined up ahead of time, it makes your case much stronger, and it makes it a lot harder for them to say, well, we'd really like to study this matter and see if we, you know, I really don't think there's a problem. We'd, welcome the little ladies down here anytime when they want to come in and do an application. <laughs> um, if you have all that stuff lined up and when you go into the meeting, you take control of the meeting and you have a written agenda 
that you go in with and you start with that agenda and you just go right through it so that so that they can't sidetrack you with various things. It's also real nice to have an attorney with you who knows employment discrimination law, so they bring up any spurious issues. For example, the port people try to say, well, I don't know about this employment, this reverse discrimination business. This is something we're really worried about. We can't set up goals for women because what about reverse discrimination suits? This is something we're really vulnerable about, you know? Jim, would you like to look into this for us? And we had our attorney right there. He said, well, Jim, the cases are da-da, 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 and the findings are da-da, 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 and it's not really a problem. Well, that shot that one down. Um, and also try to get, have specific commitments in mind that you want them to agree to. Don't just go in and say you're going to discuss the problem. Say, well, we'd like you to do such and such by X date and such and such by X date, and usually won't get an agreement to do it right at that first meeting. But maybe two meetings later you will. Whereas if you don't have anything in mind that you want right then, they can put you off with, well, we have to look into this matter. We take this into consideration. We're going to study this that sort of thing. Um, the thing is, is the, the two things are to be very well researched, prepared for every eventuality that you can think of, and have specific things in mind that you want to get out of them. We are fairly nice to people when we go out and job develop. Um, we don't bludgeon them. We say, I'm aware that you're hiring on this project. I know you're hiring women. I'm aware also that you have a 12% goal for women that you need to meet. And this, gee, you're so busy, this must be quite a burden. Uh, I know all you want to do is get your project built. And you don't care who your workers are as long as they're competent. Um, we have these women who are ready to go. Why, Sally, she's a second year apprentice. And Mary, she's a fourth year apprentice. And they're all ready to go. If you need any help whatsoever, we're here to help you kind of thing, and it's not as cynical as it sounds, it's the truth, because helping them is helping us and, you know, helping other women. We don't go down and scream and yell and threaten them and tell them we're going to file an employment discrimination complaint and so forth. If they don't hire women, we will, but... <laughs> <laughs> this tape has shown some of the people working on remedies to employment discrimination. The presence of Seattle women in Houston reflects the leadership of Washington State in working for equal employment opportunities. We Seattle Feminist Video are proud for having the opportunity to recognize their contributions on behalf of all women. From Washington to Georgia, from Florida to Maine, we keep a constant vigil, our rights to attain. Oh, sisters band together, the battle's never done. And we will not be silent till our rights...